think about Moses' decision, and there's a sort of a thumbnail sketch of Moses over there in the book of Hebrews in that great Westminster Abbey of the Bible, the heroes of faith, chapter 11, verse 23, by faith, Moses. When he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child. And they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing, this is the decision, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Now this little sketch begins, as every good biography should, with the family background. So first we have parental courage in that 23rd verse. His parents were not afraid of the king's commandment, and that paid off, because when you get down to the 27th verse, it says Moses wasn't scared either, not fearing the wrath of the king, like parents, like children. Egypt is a type of this world. Its pharaoh is the devil, the prince of darkness, and any godly parent who tries to bring up children in this world order today knows what it is to book the edicts of pharaoh style, popularity, earthly success. How to rear children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord in this Egypt of the 1970s calls for all the wisdom one can pray down as the dedicated parents of any teenager today. Takes a double dose of Christian courage not to fear the commandments of Pharaoh, risk being called odd and uncooperative out in suburbia, when you may be the only dedicated Christian parents in the block. But it can be done, and it's being done. Just as with Moses, the devil's out to destroy every promising child today. And it takes brave parents to defy old Pharaoh, and it takes faith to commit a child to God, as it were, in an ark of bulrushes by the river's brink. But when a godly mother and almighty God go in partnership, Old Pharaoh doesn't have a chance. History has proven that. I was down in Florida some winters ago in a meeting where the sweet old lady that kept the church library, oh, what a dear soul she was. She has a daughter who's a missionary in Africa. She was dedicated to the Lord, that girl, before she was born. And when she grew up, she said she wanted to go to Africa to serve the Lord, and her father didn't like it. He said, I'd die before I'd see her go to Africa. And in the spring that she went to Africa, he died. It doesn't pay the monkey with the purposes of God. There's a lot of hand-wringing about juvenile delinquency these days. One cause is that too many parents are afraid of Pharaoh, and rather their children succeed and Be popular in Egypt and be bound for the promised land. I've read of a father who bought a globe map of the world and put it in the room of his little son. And One night he wanted to look up something and went in there and woke the youngster up accidentally while he was trying to locate this spot on the globe map. And the little fellow asked the question that children might well ask of oldsters today, what are you doing with my world? That's a good question. What are you doing with my work? Oh, I thank the Lord for old-fashioned parents even in the 70s now. You can be, by the grace of God. Somebody said, as a child, I, I had the meanest mother in the world. When other kids ate candy for breakfast, she made us eat eggs and toast. When other kids had Coke and candy for lunch, we had to eat a sandwich. My mother insisted on knowing where we were at all times. You'd think we were on a chain gang. She had to know who our friends were and what we were doing. She insisted that if we said we'd be gone an hour, we'd be gone an hour or less. And I'm ashamed to admit it, but she actually had the nerve to break the child labor law. She made us work. (laughs) 
we had to wash dishes, make beds, learn to cook, and all sorts of cruel things, I believe she lay awake at night thinking up mean things for us. <laughs> she always insisted on us telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And none of this tooting the horn of a car for us to come running out. She embarrassed us to no end by making our friends come in the door to get us. My mother was a complete failure as a mother. None of us ever been arrested. <laughs> My brother served his time in the service of his country. And whom do we blame for this terrible state of affairs? You're right, our mean mother. We never got to take part in a riot, burn draft cards, and a million or one other things. She made us grow up into God-fearing, educated, honest adults. Using this as a background, I plan to raise my children that way because what this world needs is more mean mothers than that. And I say a great big amen to that. But family background's not enough, beloved. This ancestry business amuses me. A lot of folks might be proud of it, but the trouble with the ancestry business is that most like potatoes, the best part's usually under the ground. Now, we've got to make our own decisions. Have you ever stopped to think that Moses didn't get started till he got in the fight? He had to get involved. And then he had to go off and take that postgraduate course out there in meeting. You see, he tried to deliver Israel on the retail plan. God said, no, we're not going to do it that way. And out on the backside of the desert, he came to the mountain of God. And some of us know from experience that you generally come to the mountain of God on the backside of the desert. And God came to him and said, Now, I want you to deliver the people. And Moses started arguing. You know how it goes. And God says, What's that in your hand? Well, he had that old shepherd's stick. And God said, Throw it down. It turned into a snake. And God said, pick it up, and it turned back into a stick. He said, pick it up with the tail. Old Dr. Gamble said, that's the end I'd have picked it up by. <laughs> I like the way the Bible goes into minute detail. It says, pick it up with the tail. Well, that's good advice. So, Moses went back before Pharaoh and the plague set in. The water turned to blood. What a mess. Drinking water, bath water. Everything turned into blood. Old Pharaoh said, get up and get. I get out of here. But he changed his mind. Then the frogs came. You never saw so many frogs in all your day. Frogs in the kitchen, frogs in the living room, frogs on the table, frogs under the beds. Here are a frog, there are a frog, everywhere a frog. <laughs> and Pharaoh said, get going. He changed his mind. Then the lies came. That must have been a lousy time. <laughs> but it didn't work. And then the flies, no screens, no fly paper, no flip guns, no nothing. Just flies, everything. Finally, you know the story. It got around to where even Pharaoh had to surrender, at least temporarily. And God led them to the sea and made a highway right through the middle of it. There must be a, not only that family background of parental concern and courage, but in the second place, there must be a personal choice. Moses chose. I told the folks in Greensboro Sunday that the young folks sometimes think, well, I don't have to make my serious decisions now. I'll have my fling and later on. But the three most serious decisions in this world are made usually before you're 25. Your conversion, your call, and your companion. That's usually made quite early. So I'm sorry, but the serious ones come first. And there isn't much of an exemption from that. Moses made a double choice, negative. He refused to be cold, son of Pharaoh's daughter, verse 24. Turned down the pleasures of sin, verse 25. Treasures of Egypt, verse 26. Forsook Egypt, 27. All that's negative. But he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God, and he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. Now, beloved, consider what a choice this young man made. He was the only free Hebrew living. 
All the others were slaves, and his prospects were brilliant. Wealth, refinement, ease, pleasure, prestige, power, all at his fingertips. Josephus says that he was in line for the throne of Egypt, one of the most powerful kingdoms of history, one of the greatest civilizations of all time. All of this Moses could have had. And he cast his lot with a nation of slaves, risked his life for a host of ignorant bondmen living in exile, a weak, vacillating multitude of undisciplined servants, easily discouraged, often rebellious, quick to fall into sin and ape the ways of the heathen, and they vexed him till he lost his own patience and spoke unadvisedly with his lips and missed getting into the promised land himself. Nine out of ten would call him a fool for making such a choice, but he was right. He was right in his refusal. There are some things that a person must say no to if you're going to live for God. Nehemiah, we read, so did not I because of the fear of God. There's some things you don't do if you fear God. The righteous man walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, stands not in the way of sinners. He sits not in the seat of the scornful. If you travel the way of the cross, you must know how to say goodbye to the way of the world and walk in it nevermore. The vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. We sing, my Jesus, I love thee, for thee all the follies of sin I resign. I say we sing it, but not many folks do it. This world is no friend of grace to help us on to God. You young folks, if you were going to live for the Lord, you have to say goodbye world. The other day, a track, a youngster was so good at track that they thought he might break a record. And the coach said to him, Now you just could. You just could shake the world. But before you ever shake it, you've got to renounce it. And that is so true. And that young man, that girl who has decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, must renounce the treasures of Egypt and the pleasures of sin for a season. And we're living in a time where it's almost impossible to say no. We work both sides of the street. We run with the hare and hunt with the hounds. And Sunday morning, too many are in church with Moses. And all week, they're in Egypt with Pharaoh. We want to make the best of both worlds. We're afraid to call on men and women to give up the world. We've worked out an arrangement by which we dwell, we think, in the promised land and also keep our old connections back in the land of Pharaoh. And we filled our churches with a motley mob stranded in the wilderness longing for the flesh pots of Egypt who would rather have a taste of garlic than a foretaste of glory. They'd rather have what the world has, though. We need to call Christians back. To the great renunciation, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. But I read that Moses also had respect under the recompense of the reward. He had an eye on the future. Not a nation of slaves, but the nation that was to be under David and Solomon. Well, now that's worth living for and worth dying for. It didn't look good then. When you choose your crowd... You better do it with eternity in view. Get that long range before you. I know God's people don't look much now. They who suffer now. First the cross and then the crown. You don't hear much about that now in our popular modern Christianity. Maybe it's going to take adversity to bring us to the meaning of some of these precious things we sing about. But it's New Testament Christianity. It's what Moses saw by the telescope of faith in his days. I'm sure that some of his contemporaries must have said that Hebrew's crazy. But here I am, centuries later, talking about Moses. He lost his life to save it, and he went down to go up and stake his fortunes on eternity instead of Egypt. And he won. He could have loafed around in the courts of Egypt. Don't you forget, he was the son of Pharaoh's daughter, supposed to, reputed to be, and in a way he was. He could say, I don't want to get involved with that gang of slaves. I've got a chance to grow up in the courts of Egypt. I'm going to play it safe. At least he could have said that. You remember over in Judges when the credit was given to the different ones who went out to battle with Deborah and Barak? For the divisions of Reuben, there were great thoughts of heart. Why, but thou among the sheepfolds to hear the bleatings of the flocks? 
for the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. They stayed at home, those shepherds, and played tunes on their little reeds that they had turned into fives out there in the pastures. But they didn't hear the trumpet call to duty. We have a lot of them in the churches today. Cursed be Miraz who came not to the help of the Lord against the mighty. I heard of a dear old lady during the Civil War grabbed the fire poker and ran out and joined the crowd that was trying to defend the territory around her house. Somebody said, well, you can't do anything with that fire poker. No, she said, but I want them to know which side I'm on. Now, if you can't serve the Lord with anything but a fire poker, grab that, friend. But get out there. I heard of a fellow who went to a mining camp some time ago, and he was a Christian, supposed to be, and he went up with that rough crowd to work, and when he got back, somebody said, I guess you had a pretty rough time with those fellows. When they found out you were a Christian, he said, <laughs> they never found it out. That's the tragedy. It's the tragedy today. Noodles, that's a poor thing to meditate about, but I got to meditate about noodles. You know, you always have to mix noodles with something else. Chicken and noodles, beef and noodles. You don't see anybody just sit down and eat noodles. I never have. Don't be a noodle. I sure hate to be a noodle and have to be mixed with something else all the time. Stand on your own feet and be sufficient. My Lord could have stayed in glory. I'm not going to get involved with the world of sinners. And I read that the early Christians jeoparded their lives and hazarded their lives for him. I tell folks in the churches wherever I hold meetings, you know, I never have been in a church yet where most of the members thought a revival was worth going to. I never see most of the members of any church during a revival. I've had people drive in a hundred miles to the meeting. Members across the street never made it all week. And I've stood in the pulpit and said, one of these days, God's going to ask of the majority of the members of this church, where were you when the battle was on? Sitting in the comfort at home, watching the funny boys on TV and worshiping at the shrine of Frank Nopsahatra. Where were you? You didn't cast your lot with the people of God and come to his help against the mighty. Moses chose the reproach of Christ, and at the heart of it was devotion to a person. I'm worried about impersonal Christianity these days. We get involved in causes and movements and even Christianity, and not much involved with Christ. We're almost as impersonal as the machines we operate. Even religious activity has become a cold program of projects, and it lacks the warmth of the personal and preaching lacks the fire because they're not close enough to the person and involvement with people, well, it won't amount to much unless first you've been involved and identified with my Lord. Now, Moses chose the reproach of Christ. We need to recover the scandal of our faith. We're doing everything under the sun to remove the shame of the cross these days and make the gospel popular. Everything's pitched in a different key. The new church music is pitched in a different key. A great deal of the preaching is pitched in a different key. And the cross has become just a charm to wear around the neck. We're preaching a new brand of Christianity that emphasizes similarities instead of contrasts. It parallels the world instead of intersecting it. It makes no unpleasant demands. It imitates everything the world offers, copies instead of contradicts the spirit of this age. Just a better way to have a good time. We want to make it acceptable to this generation. The last words anybody would think of using in connection with Christianity today is shame, reproach, scandal, and yet that's the terminology of the New Testament. Moses esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Reproach was riches for him. The wealthiest man is a Christian who has suffered most for Christ. They used to wear scars. Now they want medals. Do you have any wounds to show? It says they that live godly, all that live godly, not some, not most, but all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. May not bear the marks of physical suffering. They don't carry in John the Baptist's head on a plate these days. They do it with more finesse. But the prophets are being beheaded just the same. Paul said, as a minister of Christ, I can really give you a list. In labors more abundant and stripes, 
above measure in prisons, more frequent in death, so of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one thrice was I beaten with rods, one stone thrice shipwrecked at the night and the day I've been in the deep in journeyings often in perils of waters and robbers and countrymen and heathen in the city in the wilderness and the sea and among false brethren, weariness, painfulness, watchings, hunger and thirst, fastings, cold and naked. That just about covers the territory, doesn't it? Can't think of anything else. He knew what it was. Thomas said, I want to see the marks of the cross. And finally, Moses had persevering continuance. He endured as seeing him who is invisible. The first time he tried to deliver Israel, it says, he looked this way and he looked that way. No wonder he couldn't do it. Went out there cross-eyed trying to deliver the Israel. You can't deliver Israel cross-eyed. Now it says he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He chose the imperishable, saw the invisible, and did the impossible. He made a choice. We have to say yes to God before we can say no to Egypt. Because James 4, 7 says, First, submit yourselves to God, then resist the devil, and he flee from it. Now, if you try to resist the devil before you've submitted to God, the devil defeats you every time. You're no match for the devil. But when you first said a great, big, all-inclusive yes to God, then you're ready to face the devil. Living in a day of either-or, it's always been either-or, but we've got a neither-nor Christianity, neither fish nor fowl, middle of the road. Old Theodore Roosevelt said during the First World War, and I remember reading about it, if you're an American and something else, you're not an American. He said America is not a polyglot boarding house. He talked about hyphenated Americans. Even the Kaiser of that time said, I, I can't understand a German-American. You can't be bold. We need a new breed today willing to be the scum of the earth and the spectacle to the world for the scandal of the cross. He feared God and so the Lord. You read about people in the Bible who feared the Lord and served their own gods. I wouldn't have thought you could do that if I hadn't read it in the Bible, but you can. You can go through the motions of fearing God and then serve your own gods anyhow. Some time ago I watched on TV the training of a seeing-eye dog. I've always admired those wonderful animals. I still stop and I see a dog in mastery going down the street. I just like to watch him a lot. The intelligence of that dog and how he thinks of things have completely overwhelmed me. I don't know how they learn it and how they do it, but there it is. And in this picture... The dog was coming down a path with his new master starting out in life together. And they had a kitten, a cat out here, lapping up milk out of a saucer. And what dog is that it doesn't like to chase a cat, but not that dog? He didn't even notice the cat. There wasn't the flicker of an eyelash. He had been trained to keep his eye on the master. Most of the church members I know today were every time a chipmunk runs across the path, <laughs> looking all directions. God help us. Keep our eyes on the left. You cannot please God with a divided allegiance. If you are 85% faithful to your wife, you are not faithful at all. There isn't any such thing as 90% faithfulness to your husband. There's no such thing. It's all or nothing. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back the cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back. If we don't learn that at Ben Lippin, nothing else will matter much. I have been in some places, not here, but I have been in some places where it seemed to me like the Bible study was swimming lessons on dry land. Studying how to swim and what to do and what not to do, but nobody ever plunged it. They never got into the water. You never learn how to swim reading books about swimming. And so they come and go away with notebooks galore. Or thy word have I hid in my notebook. But they don't do a thing about it. Not a thing. I sometimes say two frogs were sitting on the edge of a pond. One decided to jump. How many frogs did that lead? And everybody says left one. I said, no. 
I didn't say he jumped. I said he decided to jump. That's not jumping. You haven't jumped till you jump. You have that in the parable of the prodigal son. Look at it and draw a line under it. Luke 15 and 18 and then down in 20. Verse 18. I will arise and go to my father. That's the decision. Verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. That's action. When you get that combination, why, you're going somewhere. What do you suppose they'd say at the airport if you went out there and said, I'd like to get a ticket just to ride back and forth a while down to the runway? I'm going to take some brochures along about Europe and about the Holy Land, about Hawaii and all the rest, but I'm not going anywhere. I just want to taxi down to the runway. We've got a lot of people who go to Bible conference, and all they do in this world, and I level with me here tonight, I'm looking at you, just taxiing down to the runway, and you haven't taken off yet. You've been to Bible conferences galore, and I meet dear people who never, have never taken off. They never mount up with wings as eagles. They know how you do it. Oh, they ought to, but now... They've never taken off. When I was a boy, we used to gather down in the holler below my house, a bunch of the kids, and had an old gully down there. They don't know what I'm talking about up north, and I talk about a gully, but you do here, I think, you know. Kind of a ravine down there. Boys all lined up, see who could jump the gully. If you jumped it the first time, if you really went across the first time, that's all right, but if you ran right up to it and then you stop, you might never get across that gully. It gets harder every time. And I know a lot of dear people who are spending their lives spiritually running right up to the edge of the gully and they've never jumped. They have never made the plunge either in salvation or in dedication or whatever. And the Word of God cries out against that. This man began to build and was not able to finish. Putting your hand to the plow and looking back, I go, sir, and went not. Let me go bury my father. Be ye doers of the Word, not hearers only. The New Testament's full of warning against that sort of business. If you went up to the ticket counter and said you wanted a ticket just to ride down to the runway, back and forth, I know what they'd say. They'd say, well, uh, take him out gently. If you persisted, they'd get you in the nut wagon and head for a padded cell somewhere. And yet I find them all over the country. Some of you have been coming here a long time, and I want to ask you in all seriousness. Have you ever jumped the gully? Have you ever taken off? Or are you singing on Jordan's stormy banks of stand and cast a wishful eye? Canaan's fair and happy land where my possession fly. But you never have gone. I beseech you during this week, we're going to waste our time up here, and that's a lot of people. Jump together. Unless a lot of people are not satisfied to run down to the runway. But you mount up by the grace of God with wings as eagles. This isn't an invitation song, and I'm not giving an invitation, because you could come down here, and you've done that too, and I'm not basing much on emotional appeal. What somebody needs to do here tonight is go to a room all alone and really, for once, settle this thing with the Lord and consider it settled. Drive down the stake. This is it. And make the leap of real sure enough. Take it. The old rugged crows speaks of the reproach that Moses chose a long time ago. And that last verse. I'm going to leave it with you. You look like honest people. I don't know whether you can... I don't know how many can sing that last verse. I sometimes get nervous when I watch congregations on Sunday morning sing it so casually to the old rugged cross I'll ever be true. It's shame and reproach gladly. By our Lord, help us we don't bear it any kind of way, let alone gladly. But you be the judge. I think the first three verses we could all agree on on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame, and I love, and you do, yes, 
that old pros were the dearest and best for a world of love, sin, and slain. And, oh, that old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me, and I think it does from most of us, for the dearest. That old rugged crow, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me, and I think it does, from most of us. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bury it to dark Calvary, so I'll cherish it. And in the old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see, and we do. For it was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died, pardoned and sanctified me. We're all agreed on that. I want us to stand, and if you feel like you can honestly before God tonight, sing that last verse. To the old rugged cross I will ever be true. Its shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me some day to my home far away, where his glory forever I'll share. And I'll cherish it. And I'll cling to it. And I'll exchange it someday for a crown. We'll have a word of prayer. Now, Father, thou knowest how weak we poor mortals are, and how prone we are to sing through verses scarcely aware of what we're saying. We pray that thou would help us tonight to be honest about this thing. We thank God for the cross and the Christ of the cross for what this grand old song's meant through the years and what it means to us tonight. But help us to face squarely once and for all, have I really made a decision about this cross? Am I ready to say to this old rugged cross, I'll be true. It's shame and reproach. It's unpopularity, the scandal of it, and all that means for a Christian. I'll gladly bear and, Lord, there's time between now and even when we start to sing it, to say deep down in our heart, Lord, I mean to mean it right now. I want to mean it. The best way I know how I do mean it. But I think you'll need some more time to go into it more because it's no trivial thing I'm calling upon us to do. As many of us as feel like we can honestly sing it or we want to mean it. Join in that last verse, please.